Hey, welcome Cashflow Veterans. This is John with episode 37. We're talking about the book called The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth. Uh, I can't wait to get into this uh, a little bit, but I did want to kind of give you an update. I pretty much have my website up. Um, I'm finishing up getting the the daily email sequence, so I'm going to be pushing that quite a bit harder where you can come and actually get a daily email from me uh, to be able to get what it is that I'm learning, other tools, tactics, you know, strategies, you name it. And as with any uh, podcast that I have here. If you actually click in any of the descriptions that I have, um, you'll see that there's affiliate links that are a part of that. And occasionally, if you go back uh, into the old older podcasts that I have, you'll actually see affiliate offers that are in interbed uh, with the podcast itself, where I've kind of broken up a 30 minute or an hour long or an hour and a half long podcast with a couple different offers, either in the middle, at the beginning, at the end. Um, you know, er everything from Tom Woods, Liberty Classroom to uh, the Tuttle Twins getting getting books for your uh, children, uh, children's books basically that teach a lot more about what free markets are, about libertarian ideals, what liberty really means, those types of things. Um, and, and Tom Tom Woods' classroom, I mean, that whole thing, uh, his liberty classroom, just it's a whole nother way of thinking. It's stuff that I didn't learn in college. So I, I encourage you to at least consider some of those. But what I'm doing is I'm making sure, one, that the new website that I have has all the landing pages that are good to go. So I might go back and redo some of those commercials. But I'm also about to finish up uh, the sequencing for a daily, daily email sequence. So it's within a system that I have that basically integrates everything I possibly could have. I have all of my marketing kind of in one place. Uh, the website's done there. The email marketing's done there. I eventually will do a texting group uh, as well that I think will be really, really uh, useful. Um, it's one thing that I certainly want to try out. Um, but I also have uh, coming up some uh, guests that I'm getting in here dealing with uh, real estate, uh, real estate investing specifically. And uh, lessons learned, what you're doing as um, military members. I'm, I'm in the process of finishing our, or getting ready to close on a refinance. Again, that's a home equity line of credit that we're replacing our mortgage with. So as soon as that happens, I'll have some other uh, free coursework and other stuff available for you uh, to really kind of talk through why it is that I'm doing that. Uh, and, and IBC is also on, on the horizon there as well. So I can do a, a bigger deep dive into that. And I hope to get on to... Uh, MC Lobsher, the Cashflow Ninja. I hope to get on his podcast, maybe even have him or at least share uh, my interview with him on this podcast as well. Um, and basically just kind of get out, get my name out there and really grow this thing, give this thing a, a just a really huge go. Uh, also, um, for kind of homeschool parents, there's a Ron Paul curriculum. That's one of the affiliate offers that are there as well. Um, so th these are just examples of number one things that are coming up, but also offers that I have that are out there. The daily email, it's going to have the email itself is going to have a lot of value for you, but there's always going to be a link to click on. So anything, anytime that you actually put any sort of content out there, you always, always, always want a call to action with it. It doesn't mean that it has to be something that they go buy from you, a product that they go buy from you. It may very well be just a relevant article for what's going on. You know, if I was doing a political podcast, uh, even though I might be selling certain things, uh, certain books or whatever the case might be, it might just be a very relevant article to what's going on today. From a marketing perspective or cash flow veteran perspective, you know, certainly uh, I, it just might be a video or an interview that I saw with somebody who's critiquing the uh, VA system, let's say, or um, different ways to go about doing your retirement. So all the things that I talk about, but if somebody just makes a really valid point, uh, occasionally I'm just going to give you some of those as a link as well. But the majority of what I do will always have some sort of legitimate offer behind it because it's all part of an overall strategy for what I'm trying to build, how I'm implementing the ability to secede from the system. And so that's going to be intertwined with it. But the emails themselves, you'll be able to uh, actually just get a ton of value from and you'll want to read every single day because it's going to have very, very relevant uh, things for you as you look at developing your own side hustle or expanding that side hustle, what you can do to make more money, uh, change your mindset to keep more money, to reinvest it in the right things and, and how to make sure you, you beat inflation and not just by making more than inflation, but actually making sure that you are getting yourself almost out of the system entirely. That way you're not worried about what, you know, President Biden or the Fed is going to do to to the dollar. And in fact, you, you may cheer that on a little bit because you'll be set up in a way that you can actually help more people uh, combat what's actually going to be coming down the pipe. And with that, I want to go ahead and get into the price of tomorrow because it's very relevant to what it is that I'm talking about. 
So, the price of tomorrow, why deflation is the key to an abundant future by Jeff Booth. So I heard, uh, I believe he was on the Tom Woods podcast talking about this, and that's where I got uh, his stuff. This was uh, last, maybe early in the winter or late fall uh, that I heard it. And so I ended up uh, ordering the book um, and read it and was pretty fascinated by it. And he's a very, very intelligent guy, um, very well connected in the technology space. And, but he also has a really great understanding, number one, just as a business owner of business fundamentals, um, but then also being in the technology sector and seeing where it's going. But he has a really great understanding of human psychology and bringing those three things together um, is really amazing. And for me, wanting, starting really to research and getting into crypto, I'm realizing those three attributes are also um, what will help me down the line in doing that. I have a you know, big gap in the technology uh, part of it, and uh, but I understand a little bit more about fund, uh, business fundamentals and economics because I'm just a nerd when it comes to that stuff. Um, and I think I have a decent grasp on, on human psychology overall. Now, as far as implementing that, that's very much what I'm, I'm doing now, and I still have leaps and bounds to get better at. But there's also the technical side that kind of comes up with that as well. So let's go ahead and get into it. So um, he sets up, like a lot of these books do, talking about the, the state of the economy uh, as well. And I think that's always very, very relevant to the conversation about what's going to happen in the future. And so even just on page three in his introduction here, he talks about the only thing driving growth in world today is easy credit, a debtor economy which is being created at a pace that is hard to comprehend. The rise of that credit and corresponding debt is keeping us locked into a system where we are proverbial frogs in a pot with the heat of the water slowly rising and we do not notice. As we try to artificially drive an economic system built for the past, we are creating more than just economic trouble. Our current path, our world, will become profoundly more polarized and unsafe. And he's getting into the explanation of a little bit of the have and have nots and why inflation uh, truly is one of the things that creates the most amount of prosperity. It is the tax on the poor. Inflation does nothing but make sure the richer get rich, sorry, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And why? Well, it comes down to this concept uh, by a, a French economist. Um, I don't remember his first name, but last name's uh, Cantillon. So the Cantillon effect. So when when a government decides to print money, we know that that causes inflation overall. The Tuttle Twins do a great book that talk about um, the creature from Jekyll Island. And there's a great book about that that really goes into how the United States um, – developed the Federal Reserve and a lot of the shady dealings that went behind to create it that basically is responsible for a lot of the disparity that we see today, but also a lot of the strife and everything else as well. And I was talking to uh, one of my coworkers today, and I had mentioned this kind of one fact that there's a reason why I tend to be more anti-war, and it's because if it wasn't for the Fed's ability to print money with a ready-to-use uh, bank account to buy stuff and to go blow stuff up to kill people and break things like the U.S. military does, the military industrial complex, that alone allows for all the other. So any conservative that's out there that says, well, I don't like all the entitlement systems, you know, Social Security is going broke. Um, it's basically insolvent. Um, we have all these other issues that are going on at home uh, with all the division that that is being sowed in this country. And there's there's plenty of reasons for that. But one of the things that underlies all of that and makes most of that possible is the ability for our military to spend money. There's no, there's, it's, it's not just coincidence that we have the largest military in the world and the budget that we have for it without money printing being a part of it. Once governments figured out that they could do that, uh, they could then go out and spend. And that's the reason why we ended up getting into the Bretton Woods Act and pinning the uh, dollars to gold at $35 an ounce uh, of gold at the time. And it fixed everybody else, at least on one standard, because prior to that, um, leading out of World War I, uh, was 
was the fact that you have these people with competing interests and it mattered where the ledger of gold was going. And there was all these manipulations going on, which caused a lot of, of strife and a lot of people getting taken advantage of because the governments were deciding to do that. Uh, the principalities were deciding to uh, try to fix the system. And so in order to kind of bring uh, order out of chaos, they they pinned the dollar, uh, pinned gold to the, the US dollar, backed it by that. The problem is, is once we actually put everybody under that system after World War I, because we we're really, you know, the only unscathed power at the time, um, unfortunately, what that ended up doing was uh, ensuring that there was going to be more strife later on, and it allowed us to print more money. And so even though dollars were getting traded at $35 an ounce of gold, and the exchange value was there and the whole international system did somewhat normalize. It allowed us to have the ability to cheat without people really noticing. And it took until the 1970s when Nixon took us off the gold standard to where we, we had printed our dollar so much that it gave us a huge advantage to be able to trade $35 an ounce when, uh, when anybody else, if they actually looked at the value of the dollar, you might actually have to spend a hundred something dollars in order to trade for an ounce of gold. And once he took that off, that just exploded the amount of inflation that we had uh, that, that let that on. So it really comes down to the Federal Reserve uh, and the government allowing the manipulation of the currency. But what undergirds all of that is the appetite of the U.S. military, the military industrial complex to be able to use it. The cantillion effects, what that means is when that money goes directly into those industries, specifically the banking industry and the military industrial complex, big pharma has come out of that. The agriculture industry has also come out of that. All of those companies that receive the money first from the bank in the form of uh in the form of loans or whatever, are the first ones that are able to use the spending power of that dollar before it gets to the consumers where the prices are driven up in inflation. So the more dollars that are competing, it doesn't necessarily see itself until it gets to the point where it's at uh, the higher orders of, of commerce where people are actually spending it at the pump, people are spending it in the stores. You, you've, you've had all the dollars go through to kind of build up all this before all the dollars are used up by the companies who get to use the spending power first, before it gets to all the people spending it and having uh, to spend more dollars on goods that are available as well. So basically what it does is it allows companies to enrich themselves, the richer to get richer, while we now have to pay more and it actually makes us poorer overall. And for the least among us in society, there's no program there's no governmental program that's going to give them any sort of amount of money that is ever going to give them the quality of life. There's no $15 minimum wage that's ever going to get somebody to the point where they can really truly live a wage. Um, and because some of the questions that come along with that that are necessary is, okay, great, 15, what, what makes it just a $15 minimum wage? Why wouldn't you, if you can just print money, why wouldn't you do $20 minimum wage? Why wouldn't you do $200? Why wouldn't you do a $2,000 minimum wage? You know, you guarantee a certain amount of money for what it is because you can just pay them basically whatever you want if you can print the money. Well, that's kind of what's interesting is they're just making guesses. There's no equilibrium that comes with those numbers that they decide. Those are all political moves that are meant to just divide people. And any sort of pseudo scientific way of going about calculating that number is really just a jobs program to get people in the government to continue to have a job in that financial sector. I mean, it's 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 ludicrous. So. We talked about continuing effects real quick and kind of where he's coming from with this. And so it's built on a model of the industrial revolution and we're moving into the information age. We've gone from the industrial age that started basically kind of with the printing press and it's a 400, 500 year cycle moving out of the agrarian age where you know, everybody used to be able in the agrarian age, one of the greatest things was the democratization of land ownership and that became the ideal of being able to have your own subsistence farm that was there. And as the industrial age came on, everybody started really moving to the cities and were able to get better urban jobs. And while you might think that, well, they lived in squalor and there's a ton of issues with the uh, plants, with the industry, with the, the robber barons of the day. And while some of that certainly may be true, um, you still made more money and your life was still made a lot more easier because you're in a place where the economies of scale helped you live a little bit better life than what it would be uh, living on the farm in some of those places. Because some of those at some of those points in time, you could go make more money, even though there were still issues than trying to get by and living uh, 
living basically off the land, not knowing where some of that stuff is going to uh, come from. So basically by, you know, subsuming a lot of those people into industry, it, it gave people a, a better quality of life um, than they would actually have if they were to stay out on on the farm. And that's the transition from the agricultural age. And that, that takes a long process. Um, now we're moving from the industrial age and going into the information age. And this is where he comes in. He doesn't talk about it in that, those specific terms. But remember that as we come out of that, the, the government built a system on top of the industrial revolution. They built a system of, of banking and economics built for, for that system where things are highly centralized. And the thing about technology is it is vastly democratizing. It, it is extremely democratizing. The internet itself, the ability to be able to give uh, everybody the have information at their fingertips is one of the greatest revolutions that has come about. It's, it's one of the greatest inventions that has ever been about, but it's highly democratizing because it allows us to have a, a lot more value in our education and our ability to think at higher levels as, as far as like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. A lot of other things have been solved. What he's getting into is the ability for technology to take us even further that always kind of secure some of those bottom uh, pieces that are there. But it's not without the, the risk, the great risk of having strife that comes along with that. So there's an explanation that he gives for uh, our debt-based economy, which I I remember just putting in there, I was like, man, this is one of the simplest explanations that I, I've seen it and he does a great job. So <clears throat> a financial system based on credit is just an exchange of money today for money later. I give you dollars today and temporarily lose the utility of my money in exchange for having more later. A bank is lending you money, losing money today with a promise that they're going to get a higher return, a higher interest rate that you pay them back than what they lent you at today. And you have the inverse. So we as the customers have the inverse of that. The benefit is we have more money today. However, that also means that we actually have less money tomorrow to pay back uh, with a loan on interest. So we have more money to be able to spend today rather than having more money to spend on other things later because we're now paying off the debt with the interest payment. So when you look at any truth in lending statement for a mortgage, because all of the interest is pretty much front loaded in an amortized schedule, rather than a simple one, again, that's why I'm switching to a home equity line of credit, rather than doing a mortgage, uh, is because you pay half of the amount of interest in a mortgage in the first five years. So in that first sixth of you going there, the first 15 to 16% of the life of the loan, you pay o almost 50 percent or a little more of the amount of interest that you're going to pay. So they make a ton of money in that first initial prospect of it. And that's why they've also made getting a mortgage so easy because it's so lucrative for them to be able to front load their profits as a bank. So the, and this system, what he's talking about, the economic system works on trust, trust that you will pay what you said you would pay. It is the same whether that trust is in a person, a company, or government. If you remove the trust, it affects the credit worthiness of an individual or company. Remove trust from a system and the entire system can unravel very, very quickly. So if they're printing money and giving it to you and with a promise to being able to just print more money later and they're going to be able to just make money out of thin air, um, it has to, there, there are some other very specific things that have to happen in order for it to have that effect. But if inflation is really a tax on uh, the poor, what it means is they're essentially defrauding future generations from being able to do that. Because from us, if we go into debt, if our entire society is going into debt, even if it's debt to ourselves, according to the way that the, the government does it, they can you know, charge their own credit card and up their limit, the debt limit every single time that it becomes a political issue, they are able then to continue doing that and defraud more and more because the bill is going to come due. And the problem is, is because there's nothing that's backing it. If you were to pay all of the debt today, the value of the system would go down because the way that they go about talking about the dollars in circulation or the amount of assets or value of an economy and using GDP and other numbers, well, essentially they're counting the promise to pay on part of their cash. Uh, and essentially what I'm describing is if somebody's asking for money and say they're going to give you a return in the future, but they're just using it for non-legitimate 
like purposes. They're, they're using it, just basically creating money out of nothing and then being able to pay you back what they say they're going to pay you back. That basically makes the entire system a Ponzi scheme. And then there's other bits of the Ponzi schemes, whether that's social security, whether that's uh, the insurance products that they sell, not, not an insurance company specifically, but the government, if it's FDIC insured, where the government is backing a loan of something, whether it's a bank account, whether it's the bank itself, uh, whether it's the health industry or uh, any industry that it decides that it's going to give a guarantee to, um, the, <laughs> Uh, there's also a guarantee for student loan debt as well. So if the students default, the government's going to back up the the loan companies that's also there. That's why the cost of tuition is increasing. So anytime the government gets involved and offers that backing, it means that the companies that are lending will not be punished for bad business practices. And because it's basically making the essentially defrauding future uh, future generations from that, it, it basically asserts itself as a Ponzi scheme for being able to print as much money as you want to. Um, and we're going to have to deal with that. The, the bill's going to come due one day. So he also goes on, there's some other, and I want to get to some of the items that he talks about. And, but this is what, when they talk about uh, using measures to bail a bank out, or they talk about, you know, the COVID relief money that we got, all of that stuff. Um, any sort of direct payments to uh, consumers that are in the society, taxpayers in the society, or any government help when they're either printing the money or taxing to give it back or whatever the case might be. Um, Nassim Tlaib says this, and he quotes uh, one of the things that he said, and it's a book called Anti-Fragile that he's quoting from. Uh, so as Nassim Nicholas Tlaib cleverly points out in his book, Anti-Fragile, small forest fires periodically cleanse the system of the most flammable material. So this does not have the opportunity to accumulate. Syst systematically preventing forest fires from taking place to be safe makes the big one much worse. California, anybody? By continuing to add debt and kick the can down the road, the governments and digital banks have prevented some of the small fires, in this case, the pain of, of restructuring. And I realize that calling the 2008 crisis and monetary easing that allowed the economies of the world to escape restructuring a small fire is akin to calling the Great Depression a recession. The problem though, is that in choosing that option, the size of the fire on the horizon is unimaginable. And so I love the comparison that Jeff Booth makes to this where he's talking and he doesn't necessarily want to equate the small fires of the 2008 recession or the Great Depression even to, to be considered that. The problem is, is as we've tried to fix each one of these smaller problems, the problem that they're trying to patch over is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, there's a great book and there's a couple other podcasts done called the everything bubble that talks about uh, where this is going. And we don't necessarily know. And there's a good analogy of sand. If you keep piling sand uh, on the top, if you just pour a steady stream of sand, eventually it basically grows up in this dome that you see. And occasionally the whole thing shifts and then settles and then shifts and settles. We can't predict how big that shift is going to be right off the bat. We can't predict when that's going to happen, but as the sand keeps getting poured on, there's other things that we know for sure about what's going to happen to that pile of sand. Every subsequent shift and slide is likely to be as big or bigger than the one before it, and we can never know exactly when that is going to happen. As far as us, obviously, we can't just keep pouring sand onto it. We can't just create creating dollars. Eventually, there's going to come a point where it all uh, goes down and all goes away. Um, because, or some other country is going to come in and interject their uh, model on top of it. It's going to call great, cause great strife because, again, the poor are going to get vastly poorer. Look at any society, Zimbabwe, uh, the Weimar Republic of Germany, and then the runaway inflation that, that happens. It, that may not happen for another hundred years. But in my opinion, it's our responsibility for our posterity to make sure that we're trying to take care of it now before we cause a lot of harm later. Because what happens with you, when you have a devastating financial collapse like that in countries that have nuclear weapons, just as an example? Let's see. Um, he introduces at this point, it's, it's a great place to get into he, uh, artificial intelligence. And he asserts that artificial intelligence, machine learning, a lot of the stuff that's coming along with big data um, and having technology that can assess behavior and do repetitive tasks again and again and much faster than what other people uh, can do is a great niche to be able to look into 
for what tasks can be done. So one of the things I've been looking into um, that it helps in marketing as well, and there might be a point in time that um, they're having AI that's creating stories, it's creating music. So they might take a a certain artist like Louis Armstrong and just keep playing Louis Armstrong and recording it into an AI and the AI then comes back and reproduces in an original format, a style like uh, Louis Armstrong. Um, there's the voice one where I basically could go through and read a script that a company that has AI would give me. And the AI would be able to basically then to replicate my voice. And there's other ones that if I was to start making different sounds with my voice as a character or uh, to express a different type of emotion, to shout or to do something like that and to vary the emotion that comes along with it, they're also working on the ability to make that sound a lot easier. So basically what I could do is I could type out um, a, a, a book. I'll take, give you the example that I even thought of. So one of the things that I want to do and that I'm looking as far as a side hustle to test is doing voiceover. So actually uh, having somebody going on to um, the acx.com, I believe it is what it's called, where I can find a book on Amazon that somebody is paying money for, for somebody to read. That way they can put it as a, uh, use my voice to do an audio book on Amazon. Well, one of the things I thought about was, is if I can go ahead and get some of those and I have an AI that does a really good job with my voice and makes it sound very natural and the sound quality is really good because I've recorded into the AI very well, um, I could basically just upload the script into it and have the AI read it, record it, and then publish that instead. That way I'm not physically having to do it. It's going to increase my ability to be able to handle, number one, more um scripts because I could do it on multiple files a lot faster than me just sitting down and reading it overall. And I could do it all in one go and I wouldn't have to worry about it. I could go back and listen to it and do it for editing purposes. Same thing with copywriting. You can basically have uh, have it read a whole bunch of different sales copy for a certain industry and have it basically print out blog posts, print out descriptions for YouTube videos, you know, all kinds of things. And it may not always, like right now, it's still kind of in its nascency to be able to do that, but they're getting better and better and better. And some of the examples he gives is some of the games. So chess, uh, it was, I think within the last 10 years or so that basically, I don't know if a chess master could even beat AI at this point. Uh, there's another one with a Chinese game that was created over 2,500 years ago called Go. And the program called AlphaGo in its first iteration uh, did a really, really good job to learn from uh, playing other uh, actual professional Go players. And it got better and better to the point that after it learned how to beat um, these Go masters, it just continued to do so. And it would even do moves that people would question. And it, they, it would do a move at the beginning of the game that people would question, why would it even do that? And it becomes the pivotal move on down because it's gone through the motions of seeing all of the different plays, uh, or moves and strategies that would go into the game. And in the second iteration that he talks about in the book, uh, it goes even further than that to where uh, they don't even have to have AlphaGo learn by playing and have it take time, they basically can just upload uh, the rules of the game and it plays itself over and over again. And basically, uh, it was able to get uh, millions of plays within uh, a few days of running. And therefore, I mean, as soon as it was able to play a, a Go Master, there was no Go Master that could even uh, match what it was. So those are some examples. Obviously, you know, with Tesla cars, we're really, really in the nascency with that as well. As it gets better and better, it's going to revolutionize a whole bunch of different industries. And that's the point he's making about deflation is that technology is a deflationary force. It makes everything more abundant because we get more time back and it does replace jobs, but it actually offers some uh, ability to for us to really be able to focus on something else, especially if we have our other needs met as far as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We have secu uh, uh, air, food, water uh, at the very basic level, and then we have a basic level of security that comes along with that. We may not have to do a lot of the other stuff because AI is able to do that. Now, he talks about uh, what's called general artificial intelligence, which I don't know if we're going to get there. That means, so artificial intelligence right now, at least in the stage that it's in, it can only do one task. So one that's trained at doing Go can't then go learn how to play Jeopardy. A general artificial intelligence would be able to cross a whole bunch of different sectors and actually uh, streamline pr cross, uh, processes that are, are 
across generations um, and being able to do multiple things, basically a lot more like the human brain. And they're essentially trying to recreate the human brain. And if you've read anything about Jeffrey Epstein or uh, Bill Gates or any of the other conspiracy theories that are out there, it's not a theory. These guys are actually looking at how do we actually embed human consciousness into a machine? How do we actually embed human consciousness with the AI as well? And so that's uh, some pretty terrifying stuff that's out there. But these are people who've been looking at this stuff for years and years and years. Um, now, what he also suggests is that it's, it's going to bring a Obviously, there's a huge need for for energy, and this is where he gets into talking about solar power. He is very bullish on solar power uh, being basically the key to the revolution of, of green energy. That way, we're not destroying the environment the same way, and, and the amount of energy that's going to be needed for a lot of this stuff uh, is going to be very significant. It's going to be able to help itself be more efficient over time using AI to help find efficiencies for using power. Um, but he suggests, and he goes through a lot of the different uh, aspects of why solar is going to be great. But the one thing I, I didn't really see him go into, and again, he, he's much smarter than I am. I've only looked at some of these topics with uh, a, a moderate level of of research into each one of these. So I'm not an expert by any stretch, but there's certain things that I've, I've watched that uh, when I look at it, I look at the cost of manufacturing and every single piece of uh, manufacturing that goes into a solar panel uses a ton, a ton of natural resources and energy and not just any energy, but coal or gas or natural gas, petroleum. It, it uses these things that it's supposed to be replacing in vast quantities. It's one of, I would say one of the dirtiest um, as far as manufacturing goes. So I don't know, you know, at what point does that truly offset uh, the ability to do that? And everybody's allergic to the idea of, of nuclear and, and he doesn't even mention it in the book. So, I, and I don't understand that. I, I think that nuclear is really the stepping stone to get to the next level of where we need to be of free energy with, with fusion. And that may be a pipe dream overall, but I, he does even talk about in here, and I've heard at other places that uh, AI is really going to be the thing that helps us in such a quick speed to harness uh, fusion power in a way to make it sustainable over the long term. We're going to need AI to make... Uh, very quick adjustments into the system to make sure that the fusion reactor um, in the plasma and stuff say it stays uh, in the center and doesn't actually kick out to the walls. Um, and that's what a lot of those, a lot of the guys are are working on at CERN and other places. And that certainly I think is that way, but I think nuclear is that stepping stone specifically uh, looking at thorium reactors and they're not, they're not perfect by any stretch of imagination, but they're sure they are way safer than what you've been led to believe. And we could fix a lot of the energy geopolitical energy issues that we're even having right now with Russia, EU, and the United States being energy independent and all that stuff by going nuclear. And that's, it just baffles me. And I don't really take anybody seriously that talks about climate change. I don't talk, I don't take any of their arguments seriously unless uh, nuclear is considered, uh, is part of the option to, to go down because it's one of the safest ones. I mean, even Fukushima disaster. I mean, this is a thing we were able to lock down after a natural disaster happened. And there's even better ways that we can do it. Thorium offers a ton of great options for us to be able to do that. I don't necessarily think that it's the, the end all be all, but I think as far as a solution to get us to that next point or to sustain us going into the information age, I think we have to consider that. Otherwise, I think we're going to find that we have a lot more strife that comes along with it because there's too many political interests that are part of this whole green movement um, with it being such an ideological movement rather than something that actually is benefiting everybody. Uh, so that's kind of where he goes with AI. He talks about the the power itself. He gets into um, the Yale experiment. And this is where I think he does a really good job of getting into human psychology in the book. Um, and he talks about the Yale experiment where essentially he had two people that were involved and one of them knew what was going on. The other one did not. The one that uh, didn't know what was going on basically was hearing uh, questions being asked to a participant, the participant would give an answer. And if you had an, a wrong answer, uh, you would turn the electrical shock and you could dial up the electrical shock um, as uh, the instructions gave you or uh, or you didn't. Uh, if you got the answer right, you would do that. Well, the, the person who was getting shocked wasn't really getting shocked, but they were giving the wrong answers because they knew what was going on. It was really seeing how far people would go in shocking or hurting somebody else. And the only time that the the experiment would cease is if you went all the way up to full voltage to shock somebody or whether you 
uh, said, you're just not going to do it anymore. And the prompts that it gave you were, are you sure you don't want to do that? We, we think you should really do that. You absolutely should, should do that. If you ever offered any sort of resistance to it. So it was always a, a increasing, um, suggestion. And what I mean by increasing is they were more, the, uh, experimenters were more forceful in what they were telling the participant to do. And very few of them actually stopped doing it. Every single one of them got to a certain point of shock and only a few of them ever truly, truly stopped. There's nobody that said, I'm no way. I'm not, I'm never, I'm not doing that. No way. Um, and what that tells us is, uh, especially for, for marketing purposes, it, it really kind of gets to the whole boiling frog thing because and it gets into the slippery slope argument. So with marketing, there's a thing called micro commitments. And that's probably how maybe you've, it's, it's what I try to do. It's what a lot of other companies try to do. And it's the idea of a value ladder or a step offer. Basically, I want to offer you a book with that's free, just pay for shipping. So you pay a few bucks for the shipping, not, not a big deal. Or they just give you a free report after all, but inside the report is an offer for something else. Hey, here's a free weekend to come talk about real estate investing. And we're going to give you great value on Saturday and Sunday, but we're going to pitch you on a program on, on Sunday when we get it. It's going to be a $297 online program, um, or you can uh, sign up for one of our big events. It's one of the best events that we do for uh, you know uh, $1,997, and we're going to put you up for a full week to stay with us and to do this. And so they, they upsell you at every piece um, that goes, or they cross sell you on something, they downsell you with something. There's a whole system and a model that goes with it. Well, Embedded in that is the psychology of micro commitments. We're getting you to say yes and agree to certain things. Or if we get you to say no to certain things, it's saying no to the alternative uh, of what you could be doing, which makes makes it mean that you say yes. When I say like by us saying no to more things, it allows us to say yes to the right things. Well, in marketing, if you can get people to say no to the alternatives or no to the objections they may have makes it more likely for them to say yes to you. Well, the same thing is true with these uh, experiments and with human psychology in general. So this is where the slippery slope argument comes from. It's like, well, we can't, we shouldn't be doing that because that's a slippery slope. It's going to lead to worse things and say, ah, you're just being, uh, you're just being a prude. Um, Allowing some of these things really isn't going to do that. Well, it really comes to us as a society that decides what is acceptable behavior and what's not. As far as the government coming in and do that, I believe the government actually takes away our responsibility from doing that, which actually takes away the our ability to actually make a moral decision on something because we uh, basically substitute our mor- moral thinking for a- an ethical replacement that's been put down on us by a government that's laid been laid out to us in that way. Um, which is why I think it, that also kind of gets to why those micro commitments lead to moral decay. It's why, you know, a little bit of, uh, flirt flirting with a female might lead to an affair down the line. It's why, um, you know, if you do a little bit of, uh, cheating now, or you take a, take a shortcut here, it might make you more likely to take a shortcut later. Those are the types of psychology things that this is really getting into is are those little micro commitments. You know, every little slippage of moral character, uh, leads to more stuff unless you stop and really think about what it is and actually set barriers and set boundaries, knowing how to say no to the, the, the right things, that, that type of stuff. And it really takes rather than the animal side or reptilian side of our brain that seeks, you know, comfort and pleasure, belonging, um, and really sitting down and thinking about how we're going to organize our lives and what principles we're going to live our lives by. Because the more that we can embed our principles, the more likely we're going to make decisions according to those principles. Um, and that's kind of where he, he goes with, with understanding why we might come along some strife as the system tries to keep itself running. And there's a lot of companies and individuals and very rich people that have also convinced a lot of the poor that they need these programs. It's unsustainable, but they're going to continue going down that path because they feel that they have no other choice really than to do that. It also gets into the sunk cost bias where if they've been investing in the system, if somebody's been doing this for so long, they've been, and this is where from cash flow veterans perspective, you know, we've been giving our lives to uh, the military and the military mindset and the ideals of the military. And we've, we've, we forego learning entrepreneurship, learning how to do things on our own on the side, learning skills that actually provide direct value to a consumer base that's out there. And we think that we are doing defense rather than actually doing what we're, we are doing. And that's basically policing the world, which isn't defense. That's just making sure that our elites are covered in what it is that they're doing. Um, and being able to control the world uh, for the elites. 
Um, which is why I have a problem with the way that our foreign policy, I believe in the spirit of people standing in the gap to protect people. But I think that gets um, taken advantage of by the people making the decisions, the people in power that are making decisions. Um, so he also gets into, let's see, page 191. Page 191. All right, so this last little bit, I'll, I'll get through, I think, pretty quick, but there's quite a bit when he goes into for the call to action that I think is, is really important. Um, you know, every design of the 20th century was designed to have success, specifically in the 20th century, and is designed to fail in the 21st century. What he means by that is unless, uh, if it's built for the system that it's in, it's necessarily going to fail when that system changes. Um, and if it, it maintains its old thinking, it's not going to revolutionize it into itself. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not kind of perennial things that keep coming back. That's why I like the, the uh, participating uh, mutual insurance companies, um, even though they've gone out of, uh, out of favor, they're still there because of the way that they've done long-term investing and had and advocated for uh, certain tax advantages and because they've been around for 200 years to do some of this stuff. So they've certainly survived as an insurance product for a very long time. And they've been able to update certain products and services as they went through. But a lot of their core reasoning for being has still maintained uh, that ability. So there certainly are perennial things. That brings me to the current book I'm reading called The Fourth Turning by William Strauss and Neil Howe to talk about what cycles of history, what they tell us about that America's next rendezvous with destiny. And it really is the cycle of uh, the cycle of civilization and it spans kind of the lifetime. It takes about 20 to 25 years for each one of these turnings, the first turning, second turning, uh, to really complete itself. And it's basically, you know, if you look at the timeline between world war one, the civil war, like each one of these things hit these influx points and the generations that are born or grow up at certain times also have, uh, a certain reason for having that type of personality kind of as a, a collective entity. We all certainly are still individuals, um, but there is a, a semblance of agreement in how we, uh, how we think uh, things that are going on, basically the, the underlying themes that undergird each generation, but also as every generation exists in one point in time, what everybody's kind of going through at the same time. And this talks about kind of that, that turning and, Oftentimes, it always leads to war, and unfortunately, we're kind of at that, at the fourth turning at this point as we kind of head into, uh, you know, an uncertain uh, conflict with Russia. Um, he talks about cooperation and uh, game theory uh, as well. You know, we're not as logically as we really think we are. It gets into the kind of the prisoner's dilemma uh, as a part of it. So, if the system is less has has the incentives that reward, you know, cheating, most people are going to end up cheating. Um, he, he gives one example of this is the HOV lane. Like obviously if somebody doesn't have the HOV and they go into it, um, if everybody starts going into it, that's not supposed to be in the HOV lane, it basically slows everything down. So you have an advantage if you actually are encouraged to have the incentive to have more people in the car and cut down on, uh, cut down on the, the expense of driving the carbon emissions that come along with it, the inefficiencies that driving kind of brings along. So you encourage more people to combine their travel. Uh, it self-regulates itself because of how it's kind of designed. Well, the problem is inflation doesn't really do that. It, it actually just creates more massive disparity. So it incentivizes the richest to actually take advantage of the entire system, which again, drives more people to be poor. And they're going to do whatever it is that they think they need to do in order to keep that system alive. And that's kind of where game theory is kind of pushing us. And that's where I think in the fourth turning, um, the moods and themes that are reflected by generations kind of also go down this game theory path as it kind of transitions from one type of uh, economy or way of thinking to another. And so the call to action, he just talks about being able to think differently, really slow down get out of our reptilian brain and really take time to think about what it is that we're doing. And the, with the coming technological, technological disruption. And what he says is we should embrace the deflationary of the technology that a free market is actually going to be, um, basically says a true capitalist system would work well in an environment with massive deflation due to natural technological forces, um, because there would be an incentive to work harder and to keep innovating. Prices of all things would fall, yes, but those creating value would be paid for their value creation along with that. Plus, it also allows poor people to be able to have greater spending power with it 
as well. Um, so with that, I highly encourage you to go out and, and take a look at the price of tomorrow. I hope uh, the uh, podcast today really kind of got into some of the values, how I, th- how I think it applies to cash flow better, how I think it applies to business, but also just why I have some of the feelings and, and beliefs that I do about the current system we're in. Um, you know, shoot me a question, you know, uh, cashflow veteran at protonmail.com. You can always send me a question or an idea for a podcast. Um, reach out to me. I have any questions about what this was, but you know, if you want to reach out to me on any of the social media platforms and uh, say, if you've read this book, uh, give me kind of your insights, what you took from it. I'd love to hear from you with that. Take it easy. Have a great weekend.